שמעתי, ושם תודה נזבח. Good morning, I am Gary Belkin. As a member of the Sunday Service Committee, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this Sunday morning service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Miguel de Allende. We are especially pleased to welcome those of you who may be joining us for the first time. We look forward to getting to know you and for you to get to know us at today's service and at future services. You are all welcome here, regardless of your race, your culture, your gender identity, or your sexual orientation, and whether or not you follow a religious tradition. We invite you to bring your questioning mind and your expansive heart to share in fellowship, reflection, and great music. And now we go to our president, Dan Noyspiel. Good morning. I add my welcome to all of you joining us today, wherever you are. We invite you to look in today's order of service for announcements of activities and membership information. The same information appears in our weekly newsletter, along with interesting articles about our busy fellowship. If you're not already on our mailing list, please send a note to Denise at the address in the chat box. You may also be interested in joining our Google listserv and our YouTube channel, which has videos of our services that you can share with friends and family. At our newly redesigned website, you may sign up on to our Zoom services, see the order of service, donate to our fellowship, or link to our YouTube channel. Our breakout discussions are great places to reflect on this service with old and new friends. Just stay connected after the postlude music ends and you'll be randomly assigned to a room. If only one or two people show up in your room, sit tight for a minute and I'll move you to a larger group. Near the end of the service, we'll post a question to kick off your discussion. If you're a new visitor, we invite you to delay accepting your breakout room assignment so our minister and membership team can chat with you for a few minutes in our main room. And now, a few thoughts from our COVID-19 task force, a group of health professionals and care team members with expertise we hope will be helpful during this pandemic. 
To paraphrase Dickens, it is the best of times, it is the worst of times, it is the age of wisdom, it is the age of foolishness, it is the epic of belief, it is the epic of incredulity, it is the season of light, it is the season of darkness, it is the spring of hope, it is the winter of despair. While we see the light and hope of effective vaccines on the horizon, COVID-19 has touched the expat population here. And now even people within our own fellowship have contracted the virus and gotten sick. This is no longer something that only happens to other people. Some of us know one or more of those who died this week of COVID-19. We may have even recently shopped at a local store where the maskless owner is now sick with the virus. And along with our Catholic neighbors, we grieve the loss of a much loved priest to this plague. COVID-19 is really starting to hit home. The COVID-19 SMA team tells us that doctors here are very busy and in some cases overwhelmed. They're struggling to return phone calls and emails and are now prioritizing the care of patients they already know. So please get on the radar of a local doctor you can call your own. Amid all of this, please remember that most people with COVID-19 are still able to manage their illness at home. But the anxiety about what could happen in the worst case scenario can be quite debilitating, especially for those coping with illness and isolation while also experiencing the brain fog that so often accompanies this illness. Those who, who have planned in advance often cope better and experience a much less stressful journey to recovery. Please remember that our care team and minister are available for support. We urge you to do everything you can to be ready just in case COVID-19 comes to you or your loved ones. And now to Tom. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Tom Rossiello, the minister of this fellowship. And it's my privilege to be with you again this Sunday and to add my personal welcome to that of Dan and Gary. We're so glad that you are with us today. This morning's service is our third in a series of six Sunday services with a uniting theme. We've called this series season of light. On each of the Sundays, we engage with one of the holidays celebrated at this time of year and which uses rituals of light and the symbolism of light to both celebrate and convey its message. Each week, I or a guest or as in today's service some members of the fellowship who celebrate this particular tradition will share their insight into their tradition's holiday. Also, we will be enriched by the beautiful music of this season, music inspired by each of these holidays. Last week was Advent, the week before Diwali, and today Hanukkah, then next week Solstice and Christmas, and after that Kwanzaa and Epiphany. We hope you will be with us for all of them. There's so much that we can draw from the different and varied traditions, and at the same time embrace the threads of universal teachings that run through and connect so many of these holidays to each other and to our Unitarian Universalist traditions, principles, and practices. We are drawn in by the practices of this season. And there is no religious practice more ancient and more common than the lighting of candles and lamps and fires. No religious metaphor more universal and more frequently used than that of the light. Light coming to pierce darkness. Light representing hope and expectation. Light that continues to burn even when the fuel is low. Light that celebrates justice and freedom. Light helping us to see more clearly. Light guiding us on our journey. Light marking times of celebration with joy. Be it a candle or an oil lamp, a yule log or a bonfire, a star in the sky, or the sun itself beginning its return journey. This symbolism of light is central 
to the celebration of all the holidays that occur at this time of year. And now, as we do each week, we begin our service with that common religious practice of lighting a flame to create our sacred time and place. We recognize that it is with a spark of the divine in each of us that we light this common flame. The flaming chalice represents our Unitarian Universalist tradition, a tradition that welcomes and includes the light from so many traditions. After I light our chalice, I invite you to join in reciting our season of light chalice lighting words, which will then appear on your screen. Candles, lamps, fire, and stars, these are the symbols of this season. Candles and lamps to mark our days of celebration and dispel the darkness. Fires to drive away the winter chill and warm hearth and home. Stars to fill us with wonder and guide us on our sacred journey. And now we're gonna have the Hanukkah candles lit by a young seven-year-old boy, Luca Mandela Cabrera Pincus, son of Jody Pincus and Lalo Cabrera, who are now living in San Miguel.
Good morning. I'm Judith Jenya, and I'm also welcoming you to this wonderful celebration of Hanukkah this morning. Hanukkah, the festival of lights, is a testament to hope and love. Hanukkah means rededication and refers to the rededication of the second temple in Jerusalem. This came after a successful revolt against the Seleucid Empire in 160 BCE. This is the story. The Seleucid Empire was founded by one of the generals of Alexander the Great after Alexander's death. The Seleucids spread Greek culture, Greek ideas, Greek religion in every land under its control in the Middle East. Jews in Judea were granted a measure of autonomy at first, but in 175 BCE, a new king, Antiochus IV, instituted a program of forced assimilation in Judea. He outmoded the Jewish faith and practice. He desecrated the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar and erecting an altar to Zeus within the temple. The people launched a rebellion. After a years long campaign of guerrilla warfare, the Jewish insurgents know the Seleucid army. Tradition holds that when the Maccabees reclaimed the temple, there was only enough oil of, un, of a undefiled oil to light the seven lamps in the menorah for a single day. Only sanctified oil can be used in the temple. A seven branched candelabra is used in every Jewish temple. The special eight candle stand is used just for this season. Miraculously, the lamps kept burning for eight days, long enough to produce more oil. That's why the festival of Hanukkah lasts for eight days and is referred to as the festival of lights. The Hanukkah lights proclaim the miracle of a victory over the oppressor and remind us that even in the darkest time, there is always light. The miracle of Hanukkah has been repeated many times over the last two millennium. There has always been found in our midst an untainted flask of oil bearing the seal of truth. Since the Hebrew calendar is based on the lunar cycle, Hanukkah has no fixed date in the Western calendar. It can fall any time from late November to late December. This year, it began last Friday. The festival always comes at the darkest time of the year in the Northern hemisphere, and it brings light into the darkness. Hanukkah is celebrated in a home, in one's home among family and friends, and if possible, also in a temple or synagogue. Each night, one more candle is lit in the menorah, a candle stand which holds all the candles for each night of the festival, like the Mexican one you can see behind me. Since the story involves the abundance of oil, the traditional foods are fried in oil like potato pancakes called and special donuts. There are games like the dreidel, a four-sided top with one Hebrew letter on each side. In Israel, it is called a sevivon, meaning to turn. The top is used as a game of chance and people sometimes bet on the outcome. It was played clandestinely when Jews hid from authorities as a way of remaining Jewish. Since Hanukkah falls near the time of Christmas, the Festival of Lights has grown into a major Jewish holiday in the United States and now in much of the world. It involves gift giving, traditional songs and foods and storytelling. But actually it is a minor Jewish holiday at, it changed when at t TVs came into every home in America. Jews felt the pressure to have something to counterbalance the influence of Christmas. And now Hanukkah is the largest public Jewish holiday. In times of persecution, 
such as the Holocaust or when anti-Semitism is on the rise, placing a lit menorah in the window of one's home was an act of defiance. Now menorahs stand in front of public buildings and parks. We have one here in Parque Juarez. Today, our service welcomes five members, Jewish members of our UU fellowship. They will share memories of Hanukkah as they experienced it in their own families. They are Ed Tudor, Gary Belkin, Ann Feldman, who sadly is currently in a hospital, not with, but we have a video of her memories of Hanukkah. Linda Soren, Dan Newsmill, and myself. I am a child of Jewish refugees from Europe, one from Germany, one from Russia. They were secular socialists and did not observe any Jewish holidays. After they were naturalized, they wanted to be good Americans and to be seen as such. So they adopted the customs they saw as simply American holidays. We lived in rural areas in small towns where there were no other Jews. So my family celebrated Christmas, not Hanukkah, just like our neighbors. We even went into the mountains and cut our own tree. My father had been a pioneer in Palestine and helped found a kibbutz and continued to be a fervent Zionist. So in 1948, when my father, when Israel became a state, my father announced, no more Christmas, now we're going to celebrate Hanukkah. I had never heard of Hanukkah. We were told the story of the Maccabee Rebellion, and now we lit the menorah candles, and my sister and I each received one small present. Then every year we followed this new tradition without any real celebrating except for potato latkes. No special music or games or parties. I was keenly disappointed. I miss Santa Claus and the beautiful tree in our home and Christmas music. My father never explained what Hanukkah really meant. So there was this false equivalence between the two holidays for me. Christmas won out by a landslide. It was not until I was married and had my own family that I came to learn about and love the holiday. With my own children, we created wonderful celebrations with family and friends and lots of food and games and presents. And of course, an explanation of the holiday as we lit the menorah candles. I am not a great Jewish cook, but I always made potato latkes according to my mother-in-law's recipe. I served them with homemade applesauce. Unlike my childhood, my kids always look forward to Hanukkah. I now believe that Hanukkah is about the leap of faith that says that we have the inner spiritual resources to brighten even the darkest times. Hanukkah is about starting with one tiny flame and cultivating that light so that it can spread. Hanukkah is about publicizing a miracle and letting our light shine letting hope shine without embarrassment or fear. Hanukkah is about affirming that we can find a source of light and hope even in the worst of times. And even this year in the darkness of this pandemic, we can find enough undefiled fuel to brighten our days. I thought about this a lot during this week as I watched people trying to defile our democracy with seditious lawsuits, which have now fortunately been tossed out. The lights of Hanukkah proclaim that we too can be a source of light and hope for each other. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Earliest Hanukkah memories, along with memories of other holidays celebrated in our home, are those of the cultural heritage that my paternal grandparents brought with them to America from their homes in the town of 
or shtetl in the town of Borisov in what is now Belarus. They met or perhaps reunited, I'm not quite sure, in Chicago where they married in 1920, exactly 100 years ago, in what I am fairly certain was an arranged marriage. They were also first cousins. This is their wedding photo that I am privileged to retain. They lived in a neighborhood filled with Eastern European Jewish immigrants with a shared heritage and created a home that embodied the traditions and foods that they had grown up with. They spoke English, Yiddish, and when they didn't want me to know what they were saying, either Russian or Polish. I remember accompanying my grandmother to the fresh kosher chicken store with its floors topped with sawdust. As a young boy, I watched as the menorah was lit. I recited the prayer accompanying the lighting of the menorah. I ate latkes, played the dreidel game, and sang the dreidel song. I received small gifts, including Hanukkah gilt or Hanukkah money, probably just a few coins, and chocolate Hanukkah gilt, small discs of milk chocolate wrapped in foil. Traditions that were, like Ed's family in New Jersey, celebrated throughout the world. Our family had not much money, but our family celebrations were rich. Those traditions were special and, as told to me, were reserved for us in place of the ubiquitous Christmas trees, Christmas carols heard on the radio, and gifts from Santa. Much more enduring are the stories my grandparents told me, stories of what life was like in Borisov and of the relatives left behind and lost in the Holocaust. My grandmother was one of five sisters. Only my grandmother and my great-grandfather came to America. I would like to share with you a family photo in Borisov uh, with my grandmother as a teenager. From their stories, I have a cherished image of my roots. I feel so fortunate to have grown up with these traditional holiday celebrations. More importantly, I savor the stories and photos of my cultural heritage from a way of life that may be little known to future generations. Thank you. First, I'll introduce you to me as a youngster. In my childhood home, kosher dietary laws were observed, but my parents worked and drove cars on the Sabbath. However, dietary laws were not followed outside the house. My parents enjoyed trim cocktails every Thursday in a neighborhood restaurant. All Jewish holidays were celebrated. Food was very important for Hanukkah, Potato latkes were essential. Hanukkah was a festive holiday, not solemn. We lit the menorah, played with spinning dreidels, received gold foil coins with chocolate centers, and when young, one small gift each night. In early childhood, my sister and I were allowed to hang Christmas stockings on the fireplace mantel. I think our parents did not want us to feel different or as outsiders. That ended well with no trauma before I was seven years old and attending Hebrew school each afternoon after elementary school. I had the good fortune to not experience the death of a grandparent until I was 35 years old. My paternal grandparents lived nearby. 
One night they celebrated Hanukkah at our, our home, and one night we celebrated at theirs. All remaining holiday was just with our immediate family. By adolescence, we celebrated Hanukkah with my maternal grandparents and many cousins who lived two hours away. The cousins owned and operated a large shopping mall. Scheduling before Christmas was impossible. So Hanukkah was celebrated on Christmas Day. The mall featured a live Santa. One family member wore the Hanukkah cloth suit and dispensed an enormous number of gifts. I remember Hanukkah as a festive family event. On reflection, I realized the history and meaning of Jewish holidays was familiar, but not foremost. Family togetherness was. While most Jewish holidays include intending a service at a synagogue, Hanukkah does not. As an adult, I became less interested in traditional Jewish observances. My need on all Jewish holidays is to be with people I cherish, sharing a festive meal. Thank you. We are about to hear the wonderful Sephardic Ladino music of ya Flori Yagoda. He, Flori Yagoda is now 97 years old. She was born in Bosnia in Sarajevo and was raised in the Sephardic culture, speaking Ladino. Ladino is the form of Spanish spoken at the time Queen Isabella expelled all Jews from Spain in 1492. Jews scattered around the Mediterranean and retained their spoken Spanish, but they wrote the words with Hebrew characters. Ladino has preserved that 15th century old Spanish language in Sephardic Judaism. The same linguistic process went on in Germany and Eastern Europe when old German was preserved in Jewish culture and speech written in Hebrew characters and became known as Yiddish. Flori Yagada and her family fled the Nazis from Bosnia in the Second World War and ended up in Italy. Flory met an American sailor and became a war bride and moved to Virginia where she still lives. Nearly all the Jews in Bosnia were killed in the Holocaust and both the Ladino music and language are dying out. But Flory has been leading a resurgence of Ladino music and language since the 50s. She has been recognized in her home country in Bosnia, in Israel, and in the United States. She was awarded a National Heritage Fellowship and performed a celebratory concert at the Library of Congress, among other honors. In 1993, I was a guest in her home, along with the Bosnia ambassador to the United States, and Flory sang for us. It was so special. So now you're gonna hear her voice and the song that she wrote for Hanukkah that is sung around the world, Ocho Candelicas or Eight Candles. Healthy American, oh, huh? So let's go. <laughs> oh, una candelica, dos candelicas, tres candelicas, 
reciting our spoken covenant, which should appear on your screen. We respect the interdependent web of life and work for a just and peaceful world. We encourage the search for truth and meaning, strive for compassion in our relationships and seek values that will benefit our lives and the lives of others. This is our covenant. Respetamos todos los estilos de vida dentro de su red interdependiente y trabajamos por un mundo justo y pacífico. Alentamos la búsqueda de la verdad y la comprensión total. Nos esforzamos por mantener compasión en nuestras relaciones y buscamos valores que beneficien nuestras vidas y las vidas de los demás. Este es nuestro convenio. As we share these joys and sorrows and concerns, some of these have been sent in by email to Reverend Tom Rossiello, our minister, in advance of this service today. And you're welcome to do this for any future services. You may also share any joys or concerns right now in the chat box that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Judith is going to light a candle for each joy or concern that I mention. Our first candle is in gratitude that a vaccine for immunization against COVID-19 has been approved and is beginning to be distributed. A related concern is for this vaccine to be shared justly and equitably among all the people on this planet. And now a concern in the United States about stopping the threats of violence and violent action by armed militias directed at elected representatives and election officials and the institutions of our democracy. This candle represents a desire that people commit themselves to further the common good and demonstrate with 
mask wearing, distancing, hand washing, as well as caring for the most vulnerable among us. And now our caring thoughts and prayers are with Kathy Kanapa, who is in the United States receiving medical treatment for her eyes. We're told that things are going well for her and that she and Dan will soon return to San Miguel. This candle is for Fred York, a frequent guest in our services and a friend of many in our fellowship. Healing wishes because he's been experiencing a time of disabling back pain. Our thoughts and support continue to go out to Lydia Jane Phelan. If you would like to send your personal messages to Lydia Jane, you may do so via caringbridge.org website or the Caring Bridge app. And now please send your healing prayers and positive energy toward Anne Feldman, who's in the MAC hospital experiencing breathing issues. We're told that she does not have COVID and is doing better, but tests continue as they look for the source of the problem. Our last candle represents the many joys and concerns which have gone unvoiced this morning, but reside in the deepest places within us. Stan Mellon. And now for more memories of Hanukkah. When given the task of sharing a personal connection at this service focusing on Hanukkah, I found it challenging to decide on what aspect of the holiday and its historical or cultural significance I would address. Should I talk about the miracle of a tiny Maccabean army defeating a giant of a Greek Assyrian one? The human spirit surviving the destruction of a sanctuary of worship? or the tiny vial of holy oil left after the devastation and how it lasted for eight whole days. These miracles, perhaps in light of the plight of the coronavirus we're living through now and how hope has to ring eternal during these months of sequestration. The connection I've chosen to briefly reflect upon this morning is a personal one with glimpses of memories of religious traditions practiced in my own home. Growing up in a middle-class community in Queens, New York, with all of my relatives, aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, in surrounding towns throughout the New York City metropolitan area, Judaism was an integral part of our everyday lives. Relatives gathered during the cultural holidays of Passover, Hanukkah, and Sukkot to embrace the rites inherent in these celebrations, as well as partake in feasts of plenty and childhood games, gift giving, and guilt. Yiddish was sprinkled into our daily conversations at home, and my father was off to synagogue every Saturday quietly leaving early in the morning without ever suggesting that my sister, brother, or I join him. On high holy days, we parked the car several blocks from the temple. We were not supposed to drive on these sacred occasions to join our father who walked several miles from our home to Davin, don his prayer shawl and yarmulke, and join the men who spent hours listening and murmuring along with rabbinical incantations. When we had our own two children, we ended up a great distance away from these family gatherings and personally chose not to join any Jewish congregation. We had very few Jewish friends or acquaintances. And so over the years, stopped organizing or attending Passover services or any other religious occasions my parents used as an excuse in gather to gather in comforting community. 
The Hanukkah rituals, however, remained within our small family unit of four, year after year lighting the menorah for eight nights with the simplified prayer to accompany the flame, singing the traditional Hanukkah children's song and dance, which summoned up dreidels and latkes, and basking in our children's squeals of joy following these rituals. Imagine eight nights of presents compared to their friends one Christmas day opening of gifts under the adorned and lit up tree. Our children left our boat a long time ago, but we still hold on to the lighting of the menorah, done in solitude now, nevertheless offering solace and memories with its light of hope and comfort. I found this poem, Hanukkah Lights Tonight, by Stephen Schneider, which for me captures this holiday reminiscent of family and bygone contexts. Our annual prairie Hanukkah party, latkes, kugel, cherry blintzes, friends arrive from nearby towns and dance the twist to Hanukkah lights tonight, spin like a dreidel to a klezmer hit. The candles flicker in the window, Outside, ponderosa pines are tied in red bows. If you squint, the neighbor's Christmas lights look like the Omaha skyline. The smell of oil is in the air. We drift off to childhood where we spent our guilt on baseball cards and matinees, cream sodas and potato knishes. No delis in our neighborhood, only the wind howling over the crushed corn stalks. Inside, we try to sweep the darkness out, waiting for the Messiah to knock, wanting to know if he can join the party. Hello again. Our fellowship gives at least half of our income to organizations that serve the local community. With the remainder, we pay for the expenses of running our fellowship. One organization we support, Centro Infantil de los Angeles, provides free high quality care and education to children from the most financially challenged families in San Miguel. The center's program affords parents, mostly single mothers, the comfort of knowing that their children are fed, nurtured, and taught in a safe and caring environment while they work to support their families. At present, Centro Infantil is serving roughly 160 families and 200 children. 120 children are in preschool and the teachers are serving them with distance learning. Beyond education, Centro Infantil serves its children and families with food deliveries every two weeks, thanks to Feed the Hungry. For 40 of its most needy families, these dispense us are not sufficient. So Centro Infantil acts as a lifeline, delivering supplemental food purchased with its own funds. The pandemic has significantly affected Centro Infantil's income, causing it to close its daycare temporarily, laying off seven caregivers and cut administrative salaries beginning in January. Because other income streams have diminished, Centro Infantil is especially grateful um, for, for the support that our fellowship has provided. The expenses of these services, other fellowship activities, and our support of groups like Central Infantil are not fully paid for by membership pledges. So during the upcoming 90 second pause or the following music selection, or immediately after our service, please go to our donate link, which you can find in the chat box or at our website, uufsma.org. You may use PayPal or any credit or debit card to donate any amount. If you want to donate by check, bank transfer, or other means, please send me a chat or email and I'll tell you how. And thank you so much for your generosity. Yeah. 
jamia, konja mia, și ce de mică vesă. La luna mea se scoresc eu, la mări se izopretă. Conja mia, conja mia, Cicec de mică vesă, La luna mea se scoresc eu, La măr se izopretă. in a secular Jewish home, which meant the we didn't attend synagogue and I never attended religious school, but we always celebrated the holidays and traditions. It was a time of family and food, lots of food, lots of good Jewish food. When I got married and had children of my own, we always had a menorah and celebrated the eight nights of Hanukkah. I decided to ask my children and grandchildren to share some of their memories of Hanukkah, and here they are. My son said he loved lighting the candles and playing the dreidel game and seeing who could win the most Hanukkah gelt. Gelt is the Yiddish word for money, and the prize was little gold foil wrapped chocolate candies. He also said he wondered why the non-Jewish kids got so many more presents than he did. My grandkids mentioned the following. My son's family has a tradition of always listening to Adam Sandler's very funny Hanukkah song parody, and they sing along with it. My youngest grandson enjoys getting together with the family And as he said, seeing everyone's faces and lighting the candles and also eating latkes and jelly donuts. His older brother said that what he loves about Hanukkah is that every night the family comes together and celebrates our religion and sings songs. He, of course, also enjoys lighting the candles. My daughter's youngest said he likes getting together with family and friends and playing the dreidel game 
and that this year he plans on giving presents to everyone. My oldest granddaughter, who is almost 16, said that she loves to cook and that she very much enjoys helping her mother prepare a very special dinner for the first night of Hanukkah with traditional foods like matzo ball soup and latkes. She appreciates the meaning of the candles and the story that they represent. She also likes that Hanukkah occurs at the very darkest time of the year and provides eight nights of candlelight. She also loves that every night the family comes together to celebrate our religion. She is actually part of an interfaith family, so they celebrate both Hanukkah and Christmas. As you can see, everyone enjoys Hanukkah as a time of being with family, hearing the old stories, lighting the candles, playing the dreidel game, and eating a special meal together. That's how we celebrate. Good morning. As a child growing up in a working class Jewish family in Newark, New Jersey, I have vague but happy memories of celebrating Hanukkah with my parents and younger brother. I remember lighting the menorah while reflecting on the struggles of oppressed Jews thousands of years ago, singing traditional Hebrew songs, playing with dreidels, eating potato latkes and other traditional foods, and exchanging gifts. It was a joyous holiday, a striking contrast to the somber high holy days that had passed just a few months before. I was aware that this holiday celebrating freedom and light was especially meaningful to my father, who had survived the Holocaust that had taken the lives of his parents and sister a few years earlier. Though I never spoke directly with him about this, I imagine that he viewed his own Hanukkah miracle as his survival after escaping the Nazis, meeting and marrying my mother, starting a family, and immigrating to the United States. When our children were three and seven, we sought a place to help them find ethics and religion. After three years participating in a local humanist group, we realized that we wanted a more spiritual experience for ourselves. And that led us to discover Unitarian Universalism. About half the members of our UU congregation in White Plains, New York, had some Jewish background. So the celebration of holidays like Hanukkah and Passover were regular events. Kathy and I had already started to celebrate Hanukkah with our children, including lighting our menorah for the eight nights of Hanukkah, playing with dreidels and devouring chocolate coins wrapped in foil. Our children still remember visiting my father during Hanukkah and lighting the menorah together. Shortly after my father died about 20 years ago, we were sitting in the front seat of our car and overheard the small voice of our then nine-year-old son from the back seat, singing the Hebrew blessing for lighting the Hanukkah candles. When asked what he was saying, he responded, that's what Papa Willie used to say. Even after our children grew up and moved out, We've continued lighting our menorah for eight nights each year. One of my favorite Hanukkah activities has been making potato latkes and sharing them with friends at a latka party, which always brings up the great Talmudic debate. Should latkes be served with applesauce or sour cream? Hanukkah and Passover, two holidays celebrating freedom from oppression have been important cultural touchstones to us over the years. And we know they also continue to resonate with our children. Thank you. Hello again. So we are about to have a song that I think is familiar to many of you, Light One Candle, which is in our hymnal number 221. The song was written by Peter Yarrow and is performed by 
Peter, Paul, and Mary. Enjoy. children with thanks that their light didn't die and light one candle for the pain they endured and their right to exist was denied light one candle for the terrible sacrifice justice and freedom demand light one candle for the wisdom to know when the peacemaker's time is at hand become our own foe, and light one candle for those who are suffering, pain we learned so long ago, light one candle for all we believe in, the anger not tear us apart, and light one candle to bind us together, the peace as the song in our for being with us this morning and we hope you'll join us again next week as we continue our journey through this rich and beautiful season of light. Next Sunday our service will explore and celebrate both the winter solstice and Christmas, particularly their connection to each other and how Unitarian Universalists had a part in creating that connection and so many of the Christmas traditions that are celebrated in our time. It'll be a joy-filled service with lots of wonderful holiday music, including from Paula Pease, Malcolm Halliday, and many other sources. Our postlet at the end of the service today will be performed by students from the Boys Town of Jerusalem, who also did our prelude. It's a very special school that was founded in 1948, the same year as the State of Israel, and it's for disadvantaged and at-risk boys and offers education from the seventh grade through college. I hope you'll enjoy the postlude and after the postlude, our virtual coffee hour so that you can greet old friends and meet no new ones. As well as share your Hanukkah thoughts or memories or ideas that came to mind through the doors that were opened by our speakers this morning. I want to thank them 
all for sharing their tradition with us. We're so blessed to have such diversity and talent in our fellowship. I also want to extend some other thank yous. Thank you to Paula Pease and Kathy Canepa, Joseph Plummer, Dan Newspiel, Bonnie McDowell, all the members of our Sunday Service Committee, our COVID Task Force, our wonderful staff members, members Denise Gallipo, Diana Amaya, and Diego Vargas, all who put in so many hours each week to make these services possible. You know, I thought, I've been thinking about them this week, and I thought perhaps we could acknowledge them with a little bit of gratitude and some virtual applause. So if you'd like to join me in the thank you, please do now. Finally, as Dan uh, mentioned, if you're new or relatively new to this fellowship, even just visiting us today, we want to again say how glad we are to have you with us. And I and some of our hospitality team would love to meet you. So please join us after the service by just staying in the main room rather than clicking on a breakout room and that'll bring us together. And to close, I'd like to remind us as we've been reminded in this service, it's central to the holidays during this whole season of light is hope. And I know these have been times for many when it's been hard to hold on to hope. I'd like to close our service with words of benediction from the 18th century poet, Oliver Goldsmith. Hope, like the gleaming taper's light, adorns and cheers our way. And still, as darker grows the night, emits a brighter way. We'll now extinguish our flame, but not that light, not the light of hope, not the light of Hanukkah, not the light of this season, not the light of our faith tradition. As John Murray, the founder of universalism, said 250 years ago, go into the highways and byways, give the people something of your new vision, give them not hell, but hope and courage. Stay safe and share your light with the world. See you next week. Straight off the play with the light.